Vapor pressure is simple enough to define, but much more complicated to understand. In this lesson, I'll first explain how scientists measure vapor pressure. Then I'll explain vapor pressure in two ways. First, from the perspective of the liquid phase, then from the perspective of the vapor phase. Here is a bottle of water. The cap is on, so it's a sealed container. As you know, water will evaporate into the gas phase, but in a sealed container, there is a limit to how much water can evaporate into the gas phase. The limit is called the vapor pressure. To get the vapor pressure of water, all we need to do is measure the partial pressure of water in the top of the bottle. Here is another water bottle, this time with much less water in it. The cap is on, so it's also a closed system, just like our first water bottle. And even though there is less water in this bottle, the partial pressure of water in the top of the container is the same as in the first container. The partial pressure of water will equal the vapor pressure so long as the bottle is sealed, contains liquid water, and the water's evaporation condensation process reaches equilibrium. Equilibrium is an important concept in chemistry, so I'll spend the next slide explaining it. Let's imagine another closed container where enough water has evaporated so that the partial pressure of water is at its vapor pressure. This system is at equilibrium. Some surface molecules are moving fast enough and can escape into the gas phase. And some gas molecules are moving slow enough that they can be captured by the IMFs of the liquid phase. Because this system is at equilibrium, the number of liquid molecules which escape into the gas phase is exactly equal to the number of gas molecules that return to the liquid phase. In other words, the number of molecules in the gas and liquid phases are unchanging. A closed system, such as our bottle of water, will move toward equilibrium naturally. If the partial pressure of water vapor is less than its vapor pressure, water will evaporate until equilibrium is established. If the partial pressure of water vapor is more than its vapor pressure, water will condense until equilibrium is reached. It is common for students to be confused about vapor pressure. And I think the textbook does a particularly poor job of defining it. So I will explain it again from two different perspectives. First, from the perspective of the liquid phase, then from the perspective of the gas phase. From the liquid's perspective, all liquids can evaporate. Evaporation exerts a pressure on the gas phase. In turn, the evaporated gas molecules exert a pressure back on the liquid phase. When these two pressures are equal, the partial pressure of the gas is at its vapor pressure. From the gas's perspective, the vapor pressure is the maximum capacity of particles which can be in the gas phase. Below the vapor pressure, particles in the liquid phase will evaporate until the gas phase is at maximum capacity. If we continue to increase particles in the gas phase, we will be above the vapor pressure. These particles will be close enough together that their IMFs will attract them to each other, which will cause them to condense and enter the liquid phase. Remember that a particle's speed is related to temperature as shown in this figure. At a lower temperature, particles have a lower average speed represented by the blue line. The orange line represents the same substance at a higher temperature when the average speed of the particles is higher. More of these particles have enough energy to escape from the liquid phase and evaporate, as represented by the solid orange portion of the figure. Because more particles can enter the gas phase, more particles will enter the gas phase, and the vapor pressure of a hotter substance will be higher than that substance at a colder temperature. If we graph vapor pressure versus temperature, we see that all substances have a higher vapor pressure at increased temperature. 
This is why water evaporates faster when it's warmer. We'll use this same figure to demonstrate two other facts about vapor pressure. First, we'll compare the IMFs of the three substances shown. Diethyl ether is a weakly polar molecule, so it will exhibit weak dipole-dipole IMFs along with the omnipresent dispersion forces. Ethanol can engage in hydrogen bonding and has a stronger dipole-dipole interaction. Water's hydrogen bonding forces are the strongest of all, and it also has dipole-dipole and dispersion IMFs. When we compare the vapor pressures of these three substances, we see that diethyl ether has the highest vapor pressure. This makes sense because there's less attractions holding the diethyl ether molecules together in the liquid phase. On the other hand, water has the strongest IMFs of these three substances, and therefore water has the lowest vapor pressure. Lastly, I want to introduce a very special temperature for these substances, their boiling point. If you heat a substance to the point that its vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, then the substance will exert as much pressure on the atmosphere as the atmosphere exerts on the substance. This causes the rate of vaporization to rapidly increase, and large bubbles of vaporized substance will escape into the gas phase. The dependence of boiling point on pressure leads to two surprising discoveries. First, you can increase the boiling point by increasing the surrounding pressure. This principle is used by pressure cookers to cook food at a higher temperature and thus cook the food quicker. Secondly, if you decrease pressure, you decrease the boiling point. This is the reason that frozen pizzas have a different cooking time at higher elevations, where the atmospheric pressure is lower. In fact, you can boil water at room temperature, provided you lower the surrounding pressure to below 0.02 atms, which is water's vapor pressure at 20 degrees. Two more things about vapor pressure before we wrap up this lesson. First, substances with high vapor pressures are called volatile. These substances have weak IMFs holding them together, thus they vaporize easily. The word volatile has entered the English language to mean explosive or unpredictable because liquid hydrocarbons like gasoline have weak IMFs, vaporize easily, and explode upon contact with flame. Also, in a mixture of gases, each gas behaves independently. As we discussed, a liquid will evaporate into the gas phase until its partial pressure equals its vapor pressure. It doesn't matter what other gases are in the container with it. Even if we pump in 100 atmospheres of helium into our water bottle, the vapor pressure of water will not change. Up to this point, we have only considered a closed system. Open systems do not reach equilibrium because evaporating particles will not significantly affect the pressure of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is quite big. In an open container of water, the water will eventually all evaporate away. Wet or frozen laundry hanging out to dry is in another open system. The water will eventually evaporate or sublime away, leaving behind dry clothes. Time for a practice problem. Which substance has the higher vapor pressure? Remember that high vapor pressure corresponds to fast particle speeds and or weak IMFs. Water at a higher temperature will have faster particle speeds, which will more easily escape into the vapor phase and give it a higher vapor pressure. Methane has a smaller molar mass than carbon tetrabromide and therefore weaker dispersion forces. It more easily vaporizes and has a higher vapor pressure. The molecule on the left can hydrogen bond, which is one of the strongest IMFs. The molecule on the right cannot and will have less holding it onto the liquid phase. 
the molecule on the right will have a higher vapor pressure.